Thanks for joining everyone today. Uh, so today we're, we're going to talk about the OWASP top 10 and uh, specifically give like a little bit of an overview of the landscape, what is it, and um, some particular issues that might be especially relevant for web developers. So uh, first, what an overview, what is OWASP? So uh, OWASP stands for the Open Worldwide Application Security Project, and this uh, is an organization that was founded in 2001. And it's an online community that produces uh, free resources like blog posts, uh, articles, and uh, top 10 lists uh, that are designed to promote uh, security in the field of, of web applications. So what is the OWASP top 10? Uh, this is one of the resources that created by the OWASP community. Um, the first top 10 list was published in 2003, and it was a list of categories of software vulnerabilities that the community felt were especially prominent and things that they wanted uh, developers to be paying attention to. So for example, back, all the way back in 2003 on the first list, uh, buffer overflow was a category that was very prominent. Um, the list has changed over time. Um, since then, there, there have been a bunch of updates. Um, the most recent one that we'll talk most about today uh, was in 2021. So this is the 2021 top 10 list. Um, we're not going to be able to go through all of the items today. Some of these on their own are enormous categories that you could do entire talks on. Um, so what we'll do is we'll try and give a bit of an overview of the landscape of OWASP in the top 10 list. We, the items that are in bold on this list, we'll be diving into a little more deeply. The items in italics, will sort of give a, a, a quick summary of what these are. And uh, the last three items we, we won't have time to review today. All right, so there's a couple of very uh, similar looking uh, initialisms here, CVE and CWE, that uh, they're, they're, they're different things, but they uh, definitely they go hand in hand. So. Uh, we'll talk about what they are. First of all, they don't come from OWASP. They come from a different organization called MITRE Corporation, which uh, they get their funding from the, the US government mostly. Um, but these are both community projects. They, the, most of the CVEs and CWEs come from community contributions. Um, so what is a CVE? You've probably heard of these already, because if your code is in GitHub, Dependabot emails you about them once a week. Um, so you, you're probably familiar with these. So what is a CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures? These talk about a specific problem with a version range of a specific software package that um, could lead to a security problem. So uh, you, you probably get depend about warnings about library versions that you're running that have uh, known vulnerabilities in them, and those uh, have a CVE number associated with them. A CWE, uh, these are less well-known uh, because you don't have uh, weekly email in your inbox about them. Uh, but these are the common weakness enumerations, and they assign a unique ID. They're not year-based because they're sort of meant to be a little more timeless. Um, and these, again, are community-contributed uh, descriptions of kinds of weaknesses that you might find in software that could lead to vulnerabilities that might one day uh, manifest as CVEs. So uh, if you're looking at the CWE database, uh, which has thousands of entries in it, uh, the entries each have a CWE number, but um, despite the flat ID namespace, there's actually quite a few different kinds of CWEs. So you see CWE-number, you don't know if it's any of these things. Um, it could be a pillar. There are a relatively smaller number of these. These are the, sort of the most abstract level of CWE. Uh, they describe a very general problem, like um, bad design, uh, for example. Um, and then uh, you have classes which are a little bit more specific, but still not meant to be tied to a language or a specific technology. Um, and, and here's where you start to get into it. When you read about these things on the website, there's a lot of 
sort of information theory enthusiasm about these things. And I guess for a certain background of person that might help, but for me, it, it probably obscures the meaning more than anything for me. So they talk about there's these different dimensions like behavior, property, and resource. But uh, after a lot of reading, I'm still not sure what those are, so I won't explain them to you. Um, then uh, beyond classes, there's the idea of a base weakness. And the base weakness is um, still abstract, still technology independent, or, or should be. Um, but uh, describe something a little bit more specific, uh, specific problem. And we'll, we'll see some examples later. Variants tend to belong to bases, and those get language specific. So like in Java or C, you might see a, a specific variant of a problem like integer overflow, where uh, they'll say like the Java int and long types, if you make the number too big, it'll wrap around to be a negative number. That would be a variant, um, CWE. Categories and views are collections of these things. Uh, view can contain categories as well, um, but uh, either of them can contain pillars, bases, classes, variants. And then I thought I was done with this slide, and then I crammed in two more because there's a few extra kinds, like chains and composites. Um, I looked into it. There were only three chains in the entire database and four composites, so you can go click on those links later if you want. Uh, but we don't need to talk about them, I don't think. So if the last slide was confusing, I think this will help get you more confused. Um, this is how the, the sort of information hierarchy of CWEs works. Uh, we'll start with pillar in the middle. That's the, the more abstract one. A pillar can contain directly classes, bases, and variants, and they often do. But I think that the idea was that you would have pillars that have classes of of uh, vulnerability or weakness types. The classes would contain base weakness types and those base weakness types would have language and technology specific variants. But all of them can be parents of themselves or, or directly contain the others. Um, so it, it just helps to kind of to, to know roughly what the idea was with the organization. Um, views and categories are kind of similar. Uh, but they are presented differently on the website. Like if you go to the CWE website, views look different from categories, but otherwise they both can just contain all the other things. So here's an example. Um, the OWASP top 10 list itself, which was published by uh, OWASP, MITRE has created uh, OWASP top 10 uh, view. So there's a view and it contains categories for the each of the top 10 items. And so those categories are defined and they contain other base weakness view categories. Um, so you can see here like the A01, which is the top number one broken access control, has inside of it improper limitation of a path name to a restricted directory, which is a, a base type. It also has a, a variant path traversal with dots and slashes, but it also has a pillar improper access control. So you get the whole spectrum of, of that uh, hierarchy. And the other thing we learned, I guess, because you know, when you see these things just out of the corner of your eye when you're focusing on, on the code day to day, it feels like, oh, there's an authority here and everything that they do is authoritative. But it is very much a community project and they don't pretend otherwise. If you squint and look at the fine print, it says, a community developed list of software and hardware weakness types. And it certainly is. Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of editorial gatekeeping in this. I think if you went to the community and submitted a new proposal for a, a weakness type, they would just give you a number and you'd have it. Um, so for example, when, when I was trying to make sense of all of this, I came across categories called uh, comprehensive categorization poor coding practices. There's another one bad coding practices, there is very little in the intersection between them. They have a few things in common and they're mostly disjoint. So that's just kind of get the, the every flavor bean. Uh, if you pick random weaknesses out, some of them are very well developed and, and, and make sense and others are draft status or even some are deprecated and you're not supposed to refer to them anymore. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about the first item on the 2021 
OWASP top 10 list, which is broken access control. So OWASP describes this as um, access control is enforcing a policy such that users cannot act outside their intended permissions. So broken access control is when there's a failure to enforce that, and that can lead to information disclosure, modification, or destruction of data, or you know other unintended events. All right, so speaking of broken access control, um, we have a small demo and we would like to get some audience participation. So if people would like to win a free t-shirt, there's an application here you can sign into. It is the world's crappiest <coughs> chat program. And if you scan this QR code and sign in, you can start uh, posting messages and we will give away shirts to the first three people who have messages on that board. So I'm going to give it another second for people to point their phones at the screen. Give it one more second. Oh, Alex got Hello World, I see. Okay. What t-shirt size do you want? We have, uh, we have large, we have large, extra large, and double extra large. Just large, okay. All right. All right. Awesome. Lots of posts in here. I was not first. Yeah, not first. Far. Good, good, far good, from first. Good hustle, though. All right. Are we giving away the rest of the shirts, or is this? Are we saving it for later? Uh, I don't know. We're winging save it. Save it for later. Let's save it for yeah, later. Okay. 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 All right. So as you can see, it's pretty pretty crappy, but functional chat app. Um, it so has it has push notifications. If you push refresh, you'll get a notification. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the slides. We got to talk a bit more about broken access control. We'll come back to that demo in a minute. Um, so this is a list of the CWEs contained under uh, broken access control in MITRE. And as you can see, this list is very, very long. Broken access control is a huge category. Um, there are many individual items in here that are on their own huge categories. So rather than trying to go through all of these, we're going to pick one that we thought was particularly relevant to web developers, and we're going to talk a bit about cross-site request forgery, also known as sometimes CSRF attacks, or also sometimes known as XSRF attacks. Um, so what is a CSRF? So when you have a web server designed to receive requests from a client, if that client doesn't have a mechanism for verifying that that request was intentionally sent by a user, then you have the possibility that an attacker can trick the client into doing something that the user didn't want. And so we're going to demonstrate that with another QR code here. So if you scan this QR code, um, this links to a static HTML page, which does a CSRF attack against uh, the app we just showed you. I'll give it a second for people to try that. But what you should see when you load it is you'll end up redirected on the app with a message that you might not have intended to put in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that. Everybody does. <laughs> it, it, it is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why it's fair game, because everyone turns it off. Does this work on iPhone? Uh, I don't know. Does it, does it not work on iPhone? No. So, so there are. So we found out earlier today there are some QR code apps that seem like they sandbox the browser, so they don't have the cookies that you need for this to work. Yeah, yeah. So, so some of you will find that it works, and some of you may find that it doesn't work. Wait, so I should still get the T-shirt though, because you know, like. Oh, okay. okay. No, that wasn't specified. <laughs> <laughs> this right. is a strongly typed meetup. Yeah, this is a meetup. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to load it here. Oh, and it actually didn't work for me. So, yeah, it's... it was the first person. Oh, Alex was the first person to get C-Surfed as well. 
Okay, what about Pavel? Here. Okay, we've got a bunch of people sea surfed. Okay. Okay. Pavel, Which one? would you like a shirt? Sure. All right. Uh, extra large? Welcome. There we go. So I, I got I got sea surfed as well. I, I don't actually love CBs. It's not true. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about how this works. Um, oh, yes, sorry. So before I do that, I'm going to go out of the slides for a second, and I'm going to show you the code for how this works. So first of all, if I shrink that, is this legible or bigger? Let's increase font size a little bit. I think, was it? There we go. All right. Hopefully that's good enough. OK, so there are a few, few components to this. So first, this application is just uh, using server-side templating. So you know we have um, a table that prints out all the messages. And the main part where you submit a message is a form at the bottom. And this is the thing that's being attacked, right? So we have um, an endpoint slash message that um, you know, handles post requests, and it currently just accepts um, one single input for the um, the message text. Right? How does it know who you are? Yes, so it knows who you are because um, you've already signed in, and so you have a session cookie. So the way this attack works is that when we go to our attack page, which I'll also make a little bigger, right? This attack page has, as well, a form on it that has as an action the, um, the URL of our service, the message endpoint. And the form is hidden um, with a hidden input. Um, and we use JavaScript to submit this quickly after the page loads. So if you were a user, you'll notice when the page loads, you barely even see you know, that page for you know, maybe a split second before the form is submitted. And um, because of the browser's cookie policy, your session cookie gets sent with this form uh, submission. And so it ends up posting this message as if it were you. So this is the unintended, um, you know, unintended submission of a request. And that's the, the core of CSRF. And this web page is where? Uh, this web page, so in our demo, we hosted it. You'll see in the URL, it's in a Google Cloud bucket storage Google APIs. So this is on some other domain, right, is the key part. So um, you know, just by embedding this form, even on a uh, page served in a completely different domain, I can still trick a user into sending requests to your domain and, and getting them to do unintended actions. Um, and the last thing, as uh, Christoph pointed out, so if we look at our Spring security setup, um, one of the first things you have to do to make this work is turn off CSRF protection, which is on by default in Spring. Um, this ends up being done in a lot of projects I've seen because, as we'll show you in a bit, to make CSRF protection work properly in your application, you still have to do some things with your endpoints. So we'll show you how that works properly in a bit. There's a lot of example apps on GitHub that have that line of code in them. <laughs> Even Stack Overflow. Like yeah. If it's enabled by default, there is a way to be yeah. enabled. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because then the non-fixed code that you have to for them. Yeah. And if you're not using Spring Security, chances are you're you are vulnerable to this because a lot of frameworks don't enable it by default because it's a pain. Mm -hmm. Makes your examples bigger. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's bad for demos. Yeah. All right. So how how do you fix this? Well, one way we talked about is uh, use libraries and frameworks that have protection built in. Uh, Spring Security is one of those. Um, a, a related but independent attack, which we'll get to in a moment, because we have this as well as a sort of a bonus attack vector, mm -hmm. is um, cross-site scripting. They're not the same thing. They both have cross in their name, but um, they, they are often combined because once you've managed to get someone to run a request to somewhere else, you, it would help if you could also run some code in that privileged domain. So we'll, we'll get to what that is like. Um, you could add a, are you sure prompt? Like if you had seen on your phone after you scanned that QR code, are you sure you want to say, I just got C-surfed? You might say no. 
or, or maybe if it was, are you sure you want to transfer $10,000 from your bank account to someone you've never heard of, you might say no. Um, so th that's something else. And uh, finally, there's the double submitted cookie method, which is how Spring actually solves this. You can implement it yourself, or you can use a framework like Spring that does it for you. Uh, so we'll, we'll also talk about how that works. All right, so uh, we've got kind of two ways. We've got the old 90s way, because I guess we both learned web development back when BoJack Horseman was famous. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we've got the, like the, the old school HTML form, and uh, the CSERF protection there is that you have to include with your form submission a field that gives this token. Uh, and the, where, like, how does Spring know that you've submitted the correct token? It's different for every user. It stores it in your server-side session. So there's some random string. It's like a password. Uh, it's generated when your session is created. And every form submission you give has to include that as a parameter. So that's how this example app works, because it's, it's like the old school uh, request response type application. But of course, these days we mostly work on single page applications where you've got like a React app or an Angular app, and you're not really submitting forms using like HTML web forms anymore. So how does that work? That you get into more of the double submitted cookie idea, which is here. We've got a good diagram. So if you if you need to do this yourself, or even if you need to configure your single page application framework to do it, this is how it works uh, in Spring Security and probably in any other framework you might use. So um, we've got this uh, kind of, uh, what do you call that, uh, flow diagram. Um, so there's the website, that's the server side. Uh, there's the happy face, that's the browser. I'm not sure, Max can explain later why the browser is happy about being a browser. I don't, maybe, maybe some of us would be happy to be a browser. So uh, the browser requests a page. The website sends back in, in the response uh, a cookie. So there's a set cookie header in the response, which contains a, like a long random string. And then later, when the browser is sending back to the website uh, a request, it will naturally submit the cookie, because that's what browsers do. They send cookies back to where they came from. And the website can now be stateless. It doesn't have to remember what cookie it gave you. It just has to compare the cookie that you're sending in your request with an additional thing, which is a header like X CSRF token, which has to have the matching value to that cookie. So the cookie and the X CSRF header need to agree. And only if they do, then the, the request is accepted. Otherwise, the request gets rejected. Um, so those are two ways. One is to, to include a CSRF uh, parameter in a post request or a get request, and the, the server remembers what it was supposed to be. Otherwise, you can have a, a cookie and a, another header that have to agree. Either way, when you scan a QR code, your attack uh, code can't know the value of that cookie, so you can't forge that request anymore. Uh, only code that comes from the same origin as the cookie can send a valid request. All right, so we have a brief uh, demo of the fix. So if people are interested, you can scan the uh, app on the left is a, a second deployment of the, of the web app that has CSRF protection enabled. And on the right is another um, attack page. Um, but if you try and load it this time, you should find that it is not able to spoof a message for on your behalf um, because this time CSRF protection is enabled. So I'll give it another second. Yeah, we don't have too many messages in there yet. Start up real fast because it's a Java app. <laughs> there we go. All right, so I'll click on this one. Um, all right, we've got some messages in. <laughs> Higher resolution timestamps. Yeah, not, not quite it's accurate. It's only like enough. nine digits. <laughs> um, so that's me clicking on the application there. And if I, uh, we're, I'm now signed in, and if I try clicking on this attack page, I'll see hopefully the same thing that all of you would see if you did this, which is that uh, an error occurred. There's an invalid CSRF token um, in either the underscore CSRF parameter or 
the XCSRF token header, which are two of the ways that you can pass this value in, in Spring Security. Um, and just because I didn't show it before, quickly go back and show this, the um, cross-site scripting. So some of you may have noticed that the CSRF attack includes these script tags. So most sane templating engines will not allow you to inject, will not render random HTML tags that are in messages you provide them. There's like 100,000 ways to get HTML to run code. Yes. That's, that's the most straightforward of them, but there are many, many more. Yeah, um, but say you know we get a request from our product team that we want to enable rich text. Um, well, now suddenly we're, we're trying to render all this HTML and uh, oh, well, I'm going to be clicking alerts for a long time here, I think. Um, so this is an example of how CSRF attacks and cross-site scripting attacks can be really powerful together. Because if you're able to trick a user to, into um, you know, injecting something into a website's database, and then that thing can be a script that re then runs on your page in your domain, um, very bad things can happen. So we'll get back to the slides here. All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, cryptographic failures. Um, so this is the next second item on the OWASP top 10 list. This is a pretty broad category, um, but it tends to cover um, basically failures in either the cryptography itself, like failures in an algorithm being weak, um, but also failures in the use of cryptography. So for example, cryptography not being used where it should, like not properly um, hashing passwords, or um, you know some ability to bypass cryptography, uh, and we have some examples of that later. So um, yeah, uh, even if you you know rely on well-trusted libraries, which is usually the way to go, um, there are still some things that you can run into trouble with. Um, so an example of, of a a common sort of configuration error you can have with cryptography libraries is um, there being some kind of uh, selection of a less secure or weak algorithm during a, during a negotiation. So a really common one, if anyone is running a service where you are managing your own edge server and you control you know, your, own, um, your own service that's uh, doing TLS connections, um, you could, if you are not careful about setting what the allowed TLS versions are, um, an attacker could try and um, negotiate a weaker version of TLS or SSL, like TLS 1.0. So it's really important when you're configuring these things that you have like a small allow list of the versions that you want to use that are secure, which for TLS would be version 1.2 or higher. Um, similarly, there's another vulnerability um, in JWTs. So um, for people who haven't used them a lot, JWTs are you know, signed tokens, and they contain a header which describes the algorithm that is used for the signature. And there was a vulnerability uh, a few years back that affected many, many JWT libraries um, where an, an attacker could send a token where the algorithm for their signature was none, which is aka no signature at all. And many libraries would validate that because they would just accept the token, you know, defining its own signature algorithm. So that's obviously a huge vulnerability, and a lot of things had to be patched. There's one other specific example of that. Uh, some, something that, that we learned from ourselves is um, the ability to bypass encryption. We, we had a database table that was storing uh, credentials for external systems. And we had properly encrypted the, the external credentials, but um, the system that was storing and retrieving those credentials would automatically decrypt them on read. So like just regular code that was fetching those records from the database would see the decrypted versions of those credentials without running any additional code. It's very convenient uh, at programming time, but anyone who could trick the system into reading those records back from that database table would also have access then to the plain text secrets. So it's actually better to shed that convenience and keep the encrypted version of those things in memory and only decrypt them uh, when they're needed. Mm -hmm. So 
Just a quick question, the nut thing that you just said, was that like a feature, like you would provide your custom algorithm to the JWB at the time of validation? Was that what was exploited there? Because why else would you have a capability to like, hey, make your own algorithm? It's not even your own. It was in the standard. There's a list of algorithms, yeah. and the only required one was none, actually. <laughs> none of the other ones were required. But the, the idea was that this, you need to configure your, your JWT verifier with a list of expected algorithms. So you think that'd be an enum, you know? That's where enums shine. You're like, <laughs> whatever, just like a list of strings or something. Yeah, but yeah. the enum would always include none because it's mandatory. The it's the only broken it's the only mandated algorithm. What about RP thirteen? Yeah, ROT thirteen. That's a that's a classic <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> okay, so moving on to the the third vulnerability in the top ten. I'm sure most people here have seen this XKCD comic before. Hopefully, yeah. Does anyone anyone want to for for the last remaining T-shirt explain why this is funny? Because that's what we have hibernate, which injects more misery into our life. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny, but <laughs> why? Why is this funny? Because <laughs> this led to hibernate, and and I mean this is uh this is the the, the SQL injection attack, and and that's why you don't uh, let your user, hey bro, just run this query on your server. You know, can you do that for me? You don't do that anymore. So now. You basically grok the intent of the user and you translate that into a query that you form. That's why you're not passing strings directly from the user. All right. T-shirt. All right. Yeah, so injection. There are many kinds of injection. SQL injection is probably the most well-known, most celebrated uh, <laughs> type of injection. Um, we had previously demonstrated script injection into HTML when Max turned on the rich text feature of our, of our highly suspect application. Um, it, that would interpret script tags uh, that users had submitted, which is never a good idea. Um, what other types of things? Um, so the, those are the first two we've covered. The third one uh, of many is um, externally controlled input uh, to select classes or code. So there was, I remember way back in, in the old days of Java, we had struts, uh, and struts had the um, Jakarta Commons digester, was, was uh, how it interpreted input and XML that was originally used to, to parse configuration files, but we ended up using it to also read user input. And in the digester, it would just accept class names, instantiate those classes, and call setters on them, which, of course, um, people figured out you could get a struts installation to do all sorts of cool stuff. If you could instantiate a class that you name and then call set methods on it. Um, so that's the idea of unsafe reflection. That's more or less gone now because it's as well known as these other things to the people who write frameworks like that. But there were many years where that was a, a rich, fertile ground for, for exploiting uh, security problems. Struts caused the... Um, that's great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's how I didn't know what struts. I was like, where do I get my struts? You know, it was the Equifax thing. Yeah, the Equifax thing was big. Struts, uh, fun fun fact, struts was created on an airplane. Uh, what? <laughs> there was a, a guy who was on his way to a place in like Vermont or something uh, for Christmas vacation. And he's like, I have an idea for a servlet web app framework. Made it on an airplane. So yeah, another good injection example is. That was before we had the whole REST revolution. Uh, people hadn't paid attention to Roy Fielding yet. Um, the struts was based on a lot of uh, paths that are verbs. Was the idea there? Um, yeah, log for shell. So we we've probably all heard of this as Java developers. If you haven't, please go patch your application tonight <laughs> before you go to bed. Um, so the idea here is uh, older versions of log for j, like from before fourteen months ago or so. Yeah. Um, they would allow if you if you give a string to a web server that's running log for j. Um, 
it will interpret the content of what it's logging, which you can give it, if you can give it a string that it will log, as an instruction to run some code. So uh, here, this is a fairly benign example. There's the dollar sign curly brace sys colon will uh, resolve itself into a system property. This is not side affecting, so you're not gonna break anything by doing this, but you can cause a log4j to log the value of a system property, but uh, there were some other syntaxes uh, that would allow you to call into JMX and um, JNDI, the Java naming uh, and directory interface. And with those, you can actually cause code to run, kind of like the, the um, commons digester idea, where you could get it to instantiate a class and call some methods on it, uh, just by the string that you're asking log4j to log. Um, so this just shows, even if you're doing something that looks kind of like JDBC prepared statements, you, you've got the, the, sec, the, the last log.info line there. We log it with the, the empty curly brace placeholder, but even then, uh, in our example app that you can uh, click that link to go see, it will still interpret the string uh, and execute it. All right, so insecure design on item number four. So this one's interesting because it acknowledges that there is a difference between um, something that you know has a fundamental designed insecurity versus something that had a, a secure design but the implementation just didn't work properly, right? Um, although you know the line can sometimes be blurry between these two things, there is a bit of subjectivity there. Um, some CWEs in this category that we picked out as being interesting examples, generation of error messages containing sensitive information. Um, this used to be a big problem in a lot of frameworks, like Tomcat by default used to um, give error pages with stack traces, which can give a lot of sensitive information about what version of libraries that you're running in your software. Um, unprotected storage of credentials, right? This could be, is something you could imagine someone who's inexperienced being given, you know, an instruction to store passwords and not realizing that there are certain best practices around hashing and salting that you need to do in order to make this secure. Um, trust boundary violation is a really, you know, potentially complex and interesting one. You know, in every application, there are different sort of zones or domains of trust. And this is basically about uh, data or certain operations being able to move between those boundaries in ways that um, you know, can compromise the integrity or confidentiality of, of data. Um, and in, insufficiently protected credentials. So this is you know, similar to the second item, but this might be that you know, you're hashing your credentials, but you're not salting them, you know, which we now know is, is a, a best practice. Right? So, you know, the, the cure or the, the, um, the thing to do to mitigate this, right, is that it's important to budget time um, in your product design to account for these kinds of things, both in the technical design and also in understanding the business requirements and what things need to be confidential and where integrity really matters. I have another, a good real life story uh, from a previous job where we had budgeted quite a lot of time to implement two-factor authentication. Uh, this was way ahead of the curve. People hadn't even heard of it yet, but uh, it was a financial application. So it, like we, we decided it was worth the investment and the, the user support cost of, of helping people through two-factor authentication. And we had the whole design and, and you could look through the flow chart and see if people forgot their second factor or lost it, they could call customer support and ask for a new one. So that's the idea of, of insecure design as well, because there was no authentication on that. So please re reset. My phone number is this now. Text this number. And they would just do that with no additional authentication. Yeah, that's that's been an issue in a lot of organizations. <laughs> Security misconfiguration, uh, number five. So. This is another big one. Um, surprising, it's still on the top 10 list at this point because this used to be a, a major, major problem, but still is. So the idea of having in the sort of the default install unnecessary features still being enabled, 
like extra port services. I remember a long time ago when you would install a new uh, like Linux or FreeBSD or something, it would have like the finger service would be enabled. So you could just contact the port and see a list of all the users on that system uh, without any authentication. Um, and uh, I don't know if anyone's ever installed the Oracle database before, but last time I did, it still had seven or eight default user accounts from regular users up to admins uh, that you had to turn off. There was kind of a checklist of things you had to go through after installing it. Um, so that's the idea of default accounts with well-known passwords. I think, uh, yeah, what's that, sorry? Yeah, Scott Tiger, exactly. I thought it'd be fun to create, you could like have a, a cocktail bar called Scott slash Tiger. I think people would people would come <laughs> to that bar. They'd be looking for the, the bartender Oracle. Um, exactly, Scott Tiger, classic example. It was in all the documentation and many, many Oracle databases would still let you sign in as that. Um, yeah, error handling uh, that reveals stack traces. Max mentioned that before. This is kind of an example where these things aren't, all disjoint, like security misconfiguration has overlaps with, with other top 10 items. Um, security settings, uh, for example, show stack traces on errors. Default, yes, there's an example. Um, so some specific CWEs to call out here from among the 20 plus that, that belong to this category. Um, if you have sensitive information in a cookie, like a session ID or something else uh, without the secure attribute, um, people could do a, a downgrade attack, uh, cause that cookie to be sent over a non-HTTPS channel because the HTTPS or not isn't part of the origin policy for cookies. So you can get a cookie to be sent plain text. Um, also sensitive cookies without the HTTP only flag. So the example we showed earlier of the, the XSRF token that cookie, you actually want JavaScript to be able to read it because you have to send it in the request. But in most cases, something like a session ID, there's no reason that JavaScript code should be able to read it at all, even from the same origin. Uh, so to protect yourself against cross-site scripting, there's a, a flag called HTTP only that you can set on a cookie, which means uh, JavaScript, even from the same origin as the cookie, isn't allowed to read that. So as a best practice, that should always be enabled unless there's a specific need to see a cookie value from JavaScript. Um, external control of system or configuration settings. Um, there was that other vulnerability around the same time as log for shell Remember? Oh, yeah, it was, the, it was with log back. I don't remember what it was called. Yeah. And that one required that you would change the log back configuration, which required writing a configuration file, mm -hmm. which often you can. Like, if you can trick the server into writing a local file, a configuration file is an excellent target for that. Um, and in the case of logback, there was a, a configuration setting you could give it, which would cause it to become uh, another executor of, uh, of code for you. Mm -hmm. All right, so item number six, we're, we're gonna dive a little deeper into this one. Um, so this one is vulnerable and outdated components. So um, I have, here an excerpt of the definition from OWASP. It has a bunch of uh, bullet points of things that might you know, make you vulnerable if you identify with any of these statements. Um, but the middle one is the one I'm gonna focus on that I've, I've added the emphasis to, which is if you do not scan for vulnerabilities regularly and subscribe to sub security bulletins related to the components you use. So this um, item, relates directly to CVEs, right? So you'll recall the earlier on we talked about CVEs are uh, you know, descriptions of vulnerabilities in a particular version range of a particular software package. And if you are using software that has known CVEs at, at, you know, in your dependencies, then you know, this is sort of a category of weakness that you would fall into. So, you know, where do CVs come from? We talked a little bit about there being organizations that, you know, store these in databases, um, but where they come from, there are uh, globally a little over 300 CV numbering authorities. Um, you know, there are many public databases that mirror these, um, including MITRE, but also uh, NIST has a database um, called the National Vulnerability Database that also mirrors these CVEs. Um, now, 
although there are only you know these limited number of CV numbering authorities, um, some of these authorities, like MITRE, will allow people in the community, like say you, to submit a CV yourself. So if you're interested in seeing what that looks like, there's a link in the slide, um, which we'll make available after the talk. And you can see that it's basically just going through a process of filling out a form and describing what the vulnerability is, right, um, step by step. Um, so CVEs often have uh, a rating attached to them that describes how serious this problem is. Um, so this is the CVSS rating. Um, this is a standardized scoring system. And uh, what it does is it takes several inputs, which are rankings of some of the factors that contribute to the overall score. So things like, what is the attack vector for this vulnerability? Um, is the exploit theoretical or are there um, you know, working examples in the wild? Um, what's the impact? Uh, we'll talk about some of these in specific, uh, specifically. And then, um, you know, there are, is an algorithm for combining the scores of these individual factors into a sort of holistic score. So we're going to step out of the slides quickly, and we'll show you the CVSS calculator that's um, hosted by NIST. And there are several different categories of metrics, but we're just going to focus on the base score metrics because um, many CVs only have base scores attached to them. So if we look at um, this chart, I can actually go through and I can rate each of the sort of um, you know, dimensions of this score, and it will assign something to us. So let's talk about, like, let's rate the vulnerability for the, um, the chat app that we had up earlier. So the attack vector, in this case, it's going to be network, because it's anyone on the internet um, can attack this app. The attack complexity, We'll say that this is probably low. You just need to put a static page with a form and, um, and some JavaScript. Privileges required. So this is the privileges require, required by the attacker. And in this case, it's none. The attacker doesn't need any. Thank you for asking. Let's go there. Um, yeah, so privileges required. Uh, no special privileges required for this. Um, user interaction. So in this case, we do require some user interaction because the user needs to click on our link with the attack page. Um, the scope, uh, this one, it, you could maybe argue it either way. In this case, I'd say unchanged because this doesn't involve sort of moving between multiple tenancies. So it doesn't really change scope in that sense. In terms of the impact, um, there's no access to confidential data because we're not exfiltrating data. We're just um, injecting data into the system. The, uh, the integrity impact, you could say potentially this is high, depending on what inflammatory message someone makes it look like you've said. Um, and the availability impact, we would say, is probably none. Um, this doesn't really you know, take the service down. Um, so if I scroll up, oh wow, I really broke this website. Let's zoom out a little bit. Oh, it looks, yeah, it just totally broke. Let's refresh that quickly. Just click, we'll try it one more time and see if that does anything Is otherwise. Is there a we'll just... submit button or something? It's not no, a... it, no, it used to. That's weird. All right, well, Impact. yeah, I, I, I broke the website. Um, if When I plugged in these values earlier, it gave us a medium score. It was like six point something, I believe. Yeah. Um, and it would show you the scores for the individual bases. But that's that gives you an idea of how these things are calculated. Did you finish, will it? By there we go. Hey, this time. Okay, so it's a five point three in this case. You're right. Oh, there you go. You're right. Six point five. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so that's how the score is calculated. Um, another aspect here is there's an attack vector. So. Uh, or CVSS vector. So all of these factors that I've ranked get combined into this single compact vector string. So you'll often, when you're looking at CVs on a website, you'll see this string beside them. And this is sort of the, you know, the compact notation of, of this scoring, of the base score. So if I go back here. All right, so we're going to do a brief case study on a particular CV and, and uh, the rating it was given. So this CVE was one I saw um, maybe a month or so back. Um, the description of it is that a gzip, gzip source, which I believe is a class, does not handle an exception that might be raised when parsing a malformed gzip buffer. 
And so this may lead to a denial of service of the OKIO client when handling a crafted gzip archive by using the gzip source class. So in other words, um, if the OKIO client makes a request and is given back like a malicious gzip payload, it could cause an exception, which is not caught by the, the client. And so if it's not caught by anyone, it would bubble all the way up and potentially just you know, break something. So if we look at the, the, this um, panel on the right, we'll see this has actually been given two scores by uh, two different CNAs. So JFrog has scored this as a 5.9 medium, and uh, NIST has scored this as a 7.5 high. So we're going to look at these uh, vectors here and compare them to see what the difference is. So I, I already walked through this. These are the different facets we went through in the calculator that are used to calculate this score. Um, so if we compare the two different ratings, we'll notice that they mostly agree with each other. The only difference is the attack complexity. So JFrog categorizes this as having a high attack complexity, whereas NIST says this is a low attack complexity. And so that is the only difference that results in the NIST rating being um, 7.5 and high instead of medium. So um, already, you know, that's between two CNAs, we see like a difference in the rating, which already shows that there is a bit of subjectivity here. Um, but I want to talk about one in particular. At the bottom here, we have the availability. Um, both JFrog and, and NVD have categorized this as high, a, a high availability impact. So the question I have for you is, you know, in applications that you work on in your day-to-day -day life that, you know, are Java applications, would an uncaught exception be, you know, a high availability impact to your system? So the way um, the CVSS standard describes the availability impact high is that means either a total loss of availability, so the system going down completely, or else a denial of some availability that has serious consequences. Um, so in this case, we can have you know, one client have an exception that isn't caught. Uh, you know, in most Java systems I've worked in, um, you know, requests are processed on their own thread. One exception bubbling up to the top uh, would end up with um, you know, maybe one request for one user failing. Um, but I wouldn't characterize this as a total loss of availability. So already here we can see that you know, depending on how you're using this library, how you would judge the impact would be different, right? So what are the conclusions to draw here? Well, you should definitely keep track of vulnerabilities in software packages you're using. Um, but you'll have to acknowledge and build into your processes that there are currently a lot of false positives, right? Often, it's still the easiest thing to do to just update a library, but sometimes you will run into problems, right? We've all been in situations where there's a dependency version mismatch and we can't upgrade one thing without upgrading maybe 10 other things and it just becomes infeasible. Um, <laughs> in, in, so in those situations, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to use things you've learned in this talk to read the description of the CVE, look at how it was scored, and then determine, is this score accurate to the impact it would have the way I am using this library in my application? So that's what I hope everyone takes away from this part. All right? Yeah, so uh, that, that brings us to the end of the top seven of, of 10. Um, we have links here for the code and for the presentation itself, uh, these slides that you've been looking at. Uh, we can share them out as well on, on Meetup later and on the Slack uh, group, so you can have that link as well. But leave it here for a bit just yeah. to let people scan that. Some pictures happen. I think adding QR codes is the most audience participation I've ever had in a talk. So yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh yeah. So these ones offend me because they're actually abusing the uh, error correction. Yeah, yeah. Um, they've, they've got intentional errors. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
I okay. think I don't see any cameras anymore. And just a quick plug, if you enjoy uh, roasting CVSS scores on uh, <laughs> CVEs as much as we do, uh, we both work at DNA Stack. We're hiring. This is a QR code to our careers page, or you can talk to me or Jonathan uh, afterwards while we're having drinks. We've got, uh, we're hiring for Java and full stack development positions, as well as um, platform engineering. So if you like cloud plumbing, uh, come talk to us as well.